Great, great. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction, and, and it's great to be at this uh, this seminar. Um, so, I'm going to uh, present this uh, paper on robust analysis of auction equilibria. Um, this is something that uh, we started working on really a very long time ago, but have been uh, doing a lot of uh, rethinking of what we did recently, and so. That's why I'm very uh, enthusiastic about uh, returning to it. Uh, and it's joint work with Daryl Hoy and uh, Sam Taggart. Uh, cool. So I want to give you an example uh, result that we're going to uh, be able to understand after uh, after paying attention uh, for uh, half an hour or so. Um, so uh, here's a theorem. Uh, the robust efficiency, and by that I mean the fraction of the optimal welfare that's achieved in an equilibrium. And so I wrote here Bayes correlated equilibrium, but uh, you can think Bayes Nash equilibrium if, if you prefer that. Bayes correlated is a generalization. And so uh, if you want to be robust, then having a bigger set of equilibria only makes your results stronger. Um, so the robust efficiency of Bayes correlated equilibria in uh, simultaneous first price auctions. Uh, is at least uh, 0.63, meaning uh, any equilibria of if I have a, a bunch of buyers and a bunch of items and I simultaneously run first price auctions, um, we guarantee a large fraction of the optimal welfare if we were to perfectly run a matching between buyers and items. Okay, uh, I've left out some assumptions of this of this theorem now uh, for for now, um, and I also want to point out that. Uh, you know, a lot of our thinking on this was influenced by the really pioneering work by uh, Sturgenis and Tardos in 2013. Uh, and this, in fact, theorem was already known in its current form. Uh, and the main contributions of the present paper is to sort of uh, rethink how this analysis goes uh, and separate it into its distinct parts. Uh, and also generalize this theorem to uh, uh, be able to be applicable to things like uh, revenue analyses as well. Cool. Um, so I want to start out just by identifying uh, uh, several main obstacles to getting efficient allocations uh, of resources to strategic agents. Um, and the first obstacle I want to point out is externalities or complementarities. Uh, and you know, if you've seen uh, combinatorial auctions, you know that uh, complementarities are a big deal and they make it so that uh, you know, things like ascending auctions don't always reach good outcomes. Um, and so what I want you to think about with externalities and complementarities, think about you know, giving a good to an agent might block giving goods to other agents. In fact, you know, giving it to one agent might block a lot of giving a lot of goods to other agents um, and uh, when you have complementarities. Um, and I wanna try to quantify this, uh, the degree of externalities of a, of a mechanism. Uh, and I'm gonna quantify it in what I'm gonna call competitive efficiency. Uh, and this is how well competition between agents is converted into revenue. Okay, and so I'm gonna leave that as intuitive for now, but, uh, and we'll come back to see mathematically what I mean in a second. Uh, another obstacle to uh, efficiency is incomplete information. Um, the fact that uh, the bidders are responding to a uncertain environment might mean that they, they might not sort of exactly respond in a way to exactly, uh, you know, optimize uh, the outcome that they're able to achieve. And in particular, compare um, bidding in a winner pays bid mechanism with a deterministic cost versus a randomized cost. Okay, and so if you have a deterministic cost and if you're a buyer with a value above that cost, well, this is very easy. You just bid just sort of epsilon above the cost, you always win, everything is perfectly uh, efficient from your point of view, right? Now, if you have a randomized cost, now you have to trade off uh, higher winning probability, but lower utility with lower winning probability, but maybe higher uh, higher uh, utility when you win, right? And that's gonna leave some inefficiencies in the, in the s system. In particular, there are costs where you're going to lose because you lowered your bid, but you really, in hindsight, would prefer to win, 
right? Because the cost is still below your value. Uh, and so that's gonna result in inefficiencies as well. Okay. Um, so we'll call that eta individual efficiency is how precisely bids can be tailored to costs, or in other words, how much is lost in you know bidders solving their their best response problem. Cool. And our analysis goal is to be able to identify the robust efficiency of a mechanism. Meaning, I want to consider this mechanism over a family of environments. And I want to identify uh, the basically the worst environment for this mechanism of the ratio of this mechanism's performance to the optimal performance. Okay, so if this mechanism always is optimal, then this ratio is one, and we have perfect efficiency. And if this ratio, this, if this mechanism is sometimes not optimal, this ratio might be something less than one. Uh, and then we'd say, like, if this ratio is, is 0.5, then we're sort of losing half of the efficiency we could be getting. Okay, um, and just a little bit of, of notation here. So my environments ease a family of environments, like say a family of distributions, information structures, et cetera. Um, and here I'm comparing the uh, equilibrium performance of my mechanism in some environment, little e, in the family uh, big E. Uh, and I'm comparing that against the optimal mechanism from the fa uh, from some family of mechanisms I care about, so opt sub E, tailored to this environment E. Okay, so I'm comparing a mechanism not tailored to the environment to one that is tailored to the environment, which is why we say it's sort of a robust efficiency uh, uh, guarantee. Cool. Um, all right, so these are going to be the three sort of main <laughs> Uh, pieces we're going to be talking about. We're talking about uh, how well competition is converted to revenue, the competitive efficiency. We're talking about how precisely bids can be tailored to costs, the individual efficiency. And we're going to be talking about the robust efficiency of a mechanism, meaning the worst case over a family of environments we care about of the amount of uh, efficiency that that mechanism gets in any equilibrium to the optimal uh, efficiency of the optimal mechanism in equilibrium. Okay, and now the main result we're going to show is, in fact, essentially these are the only losses of efficiency that are around. And um, if we have a mu competitively efficient mechanism, and the bidder's best response problem is eta individually efficient, then the robust efficiency is uh, is beta at least eta times mu. Okay, so we lose welfare from these two sources of inefficiency, and that's it. Okay, so let me um, now give you an example application of this framework just to uh, first price options. Okay, so um, it's actually very simple and we'll do it in a, in a few slides to show that the first price option is mu equals one competitively efficient. Okay, meaning there's essentially no ex no sort of loss from complementarities in the first price auction. Okay, um, and we'll also be able to show that in pure Nash equilibrium, so when everything is sort of deterministic, uh, that uh, the bidders can basically exactly solve their best response problem. So there's sort of no loss. Uh, and uh, the mechanism is eta equals one individually efficient. Okay, now I've got a little uh, uh, star here. Um, uh, and my star here is because, well, as you probably know, in some environments, uh, equilibria and first price auctions don't exist. And so actually I'm gonna be, the analysis framework is gonna be robust to approximate equilibria as well. And so the same holds for one minus epsilon pure Nash equilibria, meaning everyone solving their best response problem to within a one minus epsilon factor. Uh, and then we're going to get eta equals one minus epsilon. Okay, for any epsilon you want. And this always does exist for the first price option. <laughs> okay, um, but a consequence of these two first bullets and my main theorem is, look, I've got eta equals one, I've got mu equals one. So the robust efficiency is one. 
Okay, and so, and as you might expect, if I have a first price auction, uh, uh, then uh, in Nash equilibrium, so when everyone knows everyone else's values, there's no loss of efficiency, right? What happens, the highest bidder always is gonna win. Highest value bidder is always gonna win in any equilibrium. Okay, and they uh, approximately always win in any uh, one plus epsilon uh, Nash equilibrium. Cool. I mean, uh, and so what happens if we're in a, a stochastic environment like a Bayes Nash equilibrium or a Bayes core, or more generally in a Bayes correlated equilibrium? And again, uh, for robust analysis results, being in the biggest possible class is best, and Bayes correlated equilibrium contain Bayes Nash equilibrium. So if you, but if you prefer thinking about Bayes Nash equilibrium, feel free to just think that whenever I say Bayes correlated equilibrium. Okay. So in Bayes correlated equilibrium, uh, uh, the loss when agents are trying to optimize their best response uh, is at most a one minus one over E factor, which is about uh, 0 0.63. Okay, and so um, combining this um, eta equals uh, one minus one over E with mu equals one, we get that Bayes correlated equilibria in first price auctions are one minus one over E robustly efficient. So um, basically what we have is a framework which quantifies the two sources of inefficiency and then shows that those are actually the only sources of inefficiency. And then you're able to show that uh, equilibria are gonna be good in mechanisms. All right, um, so I wanna take a second to review some related work. There's been a lot of very recent in, uh, recent interest in robustness in mechanism design and analysis of mechanisms. And so here I've got uh, a, a sort of a, a summary with some citations, not all the citations, some of the citations that are in this in this space. Um, and I've broken them down sort of uh, horizontal, uh, uh, horizontally, I've got analysis of you know common mechanisms in my first row. And in the in the bottom row, I have design of robust mechanisms. Um, and in the left and right column, I've got uh, absolute robust analyses and the you know ratio analyses. And the difference is, as you can see from the objective, um, absolute analysis just is asking to make sure that the worst case is not so bad. And um, uh, uh, period. Whereas relative analysis says, I want the worst case relative to how good things can be to not be so bad. Okay, and so looking at my um, my figures here, imagine I take all of my environments I wanna be robust over and I sort them by how good the optimal mechanism can perform. Okay, so here opt E of E, the optimal mechanism on in that environment, okay, is gonna be then an increasing function. Okay, and if I just sort them by that, then absolute says, well, I, I want basically the lowest thing to be at least some amount. So a bound on the absolute uh, robust efficiency is gonna be just a lower bound on all these things. And so the space of uh, you know, where my mechanism is gonna lie is gonna be somewhere in this orange region. Uh, that's over here, this orange region. Okay. Um, and with a ratio, uh, the bigger opt is, the more higher performance I have to get because I'm looking at a ratio. Uh, and so the region where my, I'm saying about my mechanism is going to lie is going to be somewhere in this region uh, over here on this side. And um, I actually think understanding the differences between these two frameworks and which one to use when is like really uh, fundamentally important. Um, the absolute notion really only makes sense if the best case situation and the worst case situation are kind of close to each other. Because otherwise, you're basically only constrained by the worst case situation. And you're basically leaving so much on the table in good situations. And who's going to choose this kind of robust approach if this gap at the, in good cases is really big? And maybe you think you're not in the worst case situation, right? So. Um, 
you know, if there's a reason to believe things are sort of already normalized so that the worst case and the best case are kind of close for the optimal solution, then I think absolute is an okay way to go about robust analysis. But I'm really nervous in cases where the, the lowest and the highest are, are far apart. And some environments you might be thinking about are uh, don't have any scale in them, in which case the worst case, and the lowest end and the highest end are actually infinitely apart. And there, this absolute notion is just not even usable. Okay, so I much prefer um, in, in settings where there can be a big difference or in settings where there's no sort of inherent scale, the problem like just saying, how good is the first price option? Okay, I prefer using a ratio. In other words, saying, how much are you getting compared to what you could be getting if you knew the environment? And this is exactly sort of quantifying the sort of loss of not knowing which environment you're in. Can I ask a question of understanding? Absolutely. Uh, so, so basically you propose here a measure for efficiency, uh, but basically you only focus on the worst outcome. But this, so the worst element in this family of environments. So, uh, but the measure of this worst outcome might be zero. So, I mean, uh, that's, why that's do you right. not consider a, an average where all the elements are weighted with their probability? That's a, that's a great question. So I just want to hit two things you said. So one, in worst case, the answer could be zero. And that's actually one of the reasons why you care about the ratio, uh, because uh, the ratio is going to force you to pick mechanisms that if the optimal solution is not getting zero, you're not getting zero. If the optimal solution is getting zero, you don't care what you get. Uh, 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 but uh, if the optimal thing is not zero, you want to not be getting zero. Whereas this absolute thing, if things are sort of vanishing in your family of distribution, then you're going to get a trivial bound. There's going to be no guarantee, basically. So you're going to be stuck not being able to do um, the absolute notion if you're in the setting you were, you were thinking about. Now, why might you care about, um, uh, why might you care about looking at this as sort of a worst case versus not assuming some distribution over environments and then optimizing an expectation for that distribution? Like you could assume, like you said, the uniform distribution over environments, right? Uh, yes. and then uh, try to maximize that expected performance. Um, and uh, I'll give you, I guess, two answers to this question. One is like, oh, now you're thinking about what distribution of environments you have, and that might be a challenge for you. Um, but the other thing is, is that from a mechanism point of view, it's like you might not be the decider or be able to finally optimize every environment. Uh, and so, you know, I'm thinking about examples like eBay, where eBay puts out a platform mechanism, and then the decider of what to do is each individual seller gets to choose, you know, how to parameterize their their auction. And uh, and somehow the, these sellers don't care about eBay's distribution over all the things they're going to sell, right? <laughs> they care about their individual auction. And so you might be in an environment like that where you actually uh, want to have guarantees per environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And in general, what we're going to, we're after is showing that this is good actually. So even the worst case is actually really great. Uh, and so that's actually going to be a, a sort of positive result for us. Um, cool. So let's, uh, let's dive into some of the details. So I'm going to be focusing my entire attention today on winner pays bid mechanisms. These mechanisms take a very special form. I'm going to ask for bids. And I'm going to run some allocation algorithm, which takes into account all these bids and decides whether each person wins. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the winners are going to pay their bids. In other words, if you think of uh, X tilde I as being either one or zero on this vector of bids, uh, then uh, bi times x tilde i is going to be uh, the uh, the payment that a bidder makes. Okay, and so the only um, question I have here about design is uh, which algorithms are good here. So how should I take bids and choose uh, choose who should be the winners?
Okay, so a one very natural way uh, is to choose highest bids win. In other words, look at the set of all feasible, look at all feasible uh, subsets of bidders and allocate to a subset uh, that with the highest sum of the bids. Okay, and so the first price auction is a special case of this where the feasible subsets are sets of cardinality at most one. Okay, I wanna give um, two examples now. Um, so one item, two agents, winner pays bid, highest bid wins. That comes as the first price auction. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna assume just full information. So if you have values 101 and 100, um, cool, what are the equilibrium bids here? Well, an approximate Nash equilibrium is the bidder with value 101 is gonna bid 100 and a penny. Um, and the other bidder bids 100. Uh, that's an example equilibrium. And uh, in this outcome, the 101 bidder wins. They pay 100 and a penny. The welfare I get is fully efficient at 101. The optimal welfare is 101. No surprises. Cool. What if I have the option? And, and now I'm thinking about uh, the application of uh, uh, of uh, advertising maybe on internet search engines where I could either show like one big ad or I could divide the space on the screen into several smaller ads. So I have a choice of sort of one ad for one person or subdividing and giving, uh, sharing the space with multiple uh, advertisers. Okay, and suppose I have two agents who exclusively want the full space uh, and three agents who are happy to share the space. Okay, and I've made up values for these agents as basically the numbers between 97 and 101. Okay, so here are some equilibrium bids. So again, it's the same thing as before for the exclusive agents and then the other shared agents just bid zero. Okay, and the point is, is that, you know, any of the shared agents, for them to get anything, they'd have to bid over 100, they don't wanna do that. Um, and the exclusive agents, well, this is the same situation they were in before. So they're, they're sort of happy in their equilibrium. Um, and so we have the same welfare as before, but of course now notice the optimal welfare is about 300 because uh, I could divide the space up into three pieces and show, and show all the shared agents and get a much higher welfare. And so again, I mean, this is sort of exhibiting this externality I was mentioning in the in the first uh, slide, which is one of the drivers of inefficiencies and in mechanisms. Cool. So as as you probably observed, the exclusive ad space is a single item auction, um, and here we already said the competitive efficiency is one. Uh, and so we said that the robust efficiency falling from that is going to also be uh, one in pure Nash equilibrium or uh, 0.63 in Bayes correlated equilibria. Um, the shared ad space, uh, misspelled ad, sorry, um, is basically an M item combinatorial auction. Okay, and we'll be we'll see later that um, uh, the competitive efficiency of an M item combinatorial auction uh, is one over M. Meaning the more items I have for sale in this combinatorial auction, the lower the fraction of the optimal efficiency can be. Okay, and uh, uh, so if I had in my example, three, uh, uh, basically three items that I either allocate all to one bidder or I, I divide them up and allocate them each individually to bidders. Um, there were actually getting this. We could have gotten 300-ish, we got 100, we're a third, right? And so, um, you know, as the number of items goes up, you know, this efficiency degrades significantly with the number of items, right? So if you had 100 items, different items to, uh, in this situation, you're getting 100th of the optimal efficiency. Okay, and so, you know, our perspective on this really is um, the competitive efficiency of a mechanism is really quantifying, you know, approximately how efficient any equilibrium is going to be. 
Cool. So here is um, my agenda. Uh, these uh, second, third, and fourth sessions are actually going to be fairly, I've got like a slide each on them. Um, so hopefully it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, not quite as long as my introduction. Um, I'm going to basically show you how to uh, decompose uh, the analysis into these two components, the individual efficiency and the competitive efficiency and the proof of the theorem. Uh, and then we'll look at how you analyze individual efficiency to show uh, the two results I showed, which is the uh, individual efficiency of one or one minus one over E in the pure Nash versus the base correlated. Uh, and then I'll show you how to do uh, competitive efficiency uh, arguments. All right. Um, so I want to start out with some geometry of best response. Okay, so, and what I want to say here is think of just one bidder bidding uh, in an auction. And, you know, they face their interim, the interim mechanism, which is once they have their value, they have some beliefs of what other people are doing and they're best responding to that. Okay, and basically what I want to say is either this bidder is going to get a high utility, right? Or there's a good reason they weren't getting a high utility is because the competition was really high. And maybe, you know, other, you know, it was a very competitive situation. So either their utility is high or the competition is high. It can't be both the case that their utility is low and there's no competition. That wouldn't make sense. They should be better, best responding better than that. Okay, so let's um, see what this looks like. So from this bidder's point of view, in a winner pays bid mechanism, there is an interim allocation rule which maps their bid to a probability of winning. Okay, the higher the bid, the higher their probability of winning. So I've shown such a example interim allocation rule here, I'll x tilde, um, and this bidder has some value and they're wondering what they should do. Okay, well, their utility, given their value in any possible bid they can put in, is their value minus their bid times the probability they win. And so geometrically in this picture, that is a rectangle. In other words, value minus bid is this horizontal difference. And the probability you win given your bid is this vertical distance at your bid. Okay, so that utility uh, is given by this rectangle. Cool. So another way I can view this interim allocation rule is as the CDF of a random threshold, which I'll call B hat. Okay, in other words, you can think of this random, uh, uh, this, this random, this interim bid allocation rule as drawing some B hat from a distribution and this player wins whenever their bid is above B hat. Okay, and viewing X tilde as the CDF as a random threshold allows me to say, well, what's the expected threshold uh, that this bidder faces in this auction? Well, it's just the expectation of B hat, which from the definition of expectation is just the integral of one minus the CDF, which is exactly this area. The integral of one minus the CDF. Exactly this area. Okay. And so um, I can also depict the agent's value on this, uh, on this picture. Their value is basically one times V, which is the area of this uh, rectangle that I'm flashing. Okay. And so now my question is, I'm trying to sort of say, look, um, A to individual efficiency is going to be the fraction of the agent's value that is essentially covered by their utility and the expected threshold, okay? In other words, if you look at this utility, it's covering some part of the, this area of the edges value and this expected threshold is covering some part, but you see their gaps. I'm sort of leaving some parts with sort of, there, there's some gaps here. And so ADA individual efficiency is saying like, how big are those gaps? We wanna say those gaps are small. Okay, in other words, ADA is big. We get a large part of our, our value.
Okay, and actually you can see why in deterministic mechanisms, uh, so like in pure Nash equilibrium, uh, there's this randomized B hat, it's just gonna be a deterministic B hat, right? It just steps from zero to one, right? And then if your value's above, you're just gonna bid exactly just sort of, you know, tiny amount above this thing. And they're gonna be essentially no gaps, right? So it's gonna be exactly eta equal one, right? But when it's randomized, you're not gonna be able to get exactly eta equal one, there are gonna be gaps because you're gonna be bidding below and you're gonna be losing even when your the B hat that was drawn is less than your value. Cool. So that's um, individual efficiency. Uh, I now want to define uh, what I call uh, competitive efficiency, which is how well is competition converted into revenue? And this, I'm just going to define it this way. Um, I want to know, uh, again, so I'm thinking of quantifying the competition that a bidder faces in terms of this B hat, right? So if B hat is big, they're facing a lot of competition. If B hat is small, they're not facing that much competition, right? So I'm quantifying competition by this capital B hat, okay? And so now I can do a funny thing. I could say, well, so what if these capital B hats, these expected thresholds, you know, what if, um, you know, those were actually the bids of the bidders and I was trying to optimize my, you know, surplus of those expected thresholds. Okay, um, and so that sort of is saying sort of it's bounding sort of how much the how big the competition is in the environment. And then I want to say uh, basically this um, kind of efficiency is how well the competition converts to revenue is like how well the expected revenue is compared to this quantification of competition. Okay, um, so I want, you know, a large fraction. So I want mu to be big here close to one. Okay, so um, the theorem is that these are basically the only two losses of efficiency in equilibria, uh, that uh, the equilibrium welfare is always at least eta times mu. And actually the proof of this is, is just a few lines of algebra. So I wanna quickly walk through the proof and, and then we'll see sort of how to, and get more intuition for these two quantities, the individual efficiency and the competitive efficiency. Okay, so let's fix a profile of values and apply eta individual efficiency. Okay, so just plugging in the definition, we have for uh, some agent i that their utility with this value is at least their expected threshold, uh, uh, plus their expected threshold is at least eta times uh, vi. Okay, um, now I'm basically going to just multiply through some of this equation with a number uh, xi of v, xi star of v, which is just a number that's between zero and one. Okay, so this equation, if I multiply two of the terms, if I multiply all the terms by this number, I've done nothing, right? And this is a number between zero and one. And so if I multiply two of the terms on one side, but not the first term, that only makes this equation more true. Okay, and now what is this x star of v? Um, I'm looking at the optimal uh, allocation uh, for maximizing welfare on this profile of value. So what is the best thing to do point-wise? That's what x star of v is. Okay, um, now I'm gonna sum over all agents i and apply mu competitive efficiency. Okay, so what I want you to pay attention to is this middle term here and this middle term here. And what is opt of the of the expected thresholds? Well, it's the best way I could, you know, thinking of these expected thresholds as values, um, choose a feasible subset of the agents to sum over the expected thresholds they're getting. Well, look, here is the sum over the agents of the expected thresholds and some allocation. And so opt is only bigger, right? Um, 
And so if the expected revenue is at least mu times op, then the expected revenue is also at least mu times this sum over uh, agents i of xi star. Okay. Uh, and so I can substitute in one over mu times the expected revenue, plugging in competitive efficiency. Okay. And um, mu is a uh, one over mu is a number less than one. So one over mu is a number bigger than one. So if I also multiply one over mu times utility, I only make this side of the equation bigger. Right. And so now I can say, well, utility and revenue, that is equal to welfare. And so I have one over mu times welfare is at least eta times opt. And regrouping, I get the result I wanted, that welfare is at least uh, eta mu opt. Okay, so simple algebra that says these definitions are sort of the right definitions for analyzing robust efficiency. Cool. Uh, this is a fine spot to take questions. My next, the thing I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail in how you analyze individual efficiency. And we're gonna get an idea for what this quantity is and into more detail about how you analyze competitive efficiency so that we know what this quantity is. Okay, but the conclusion is these are the two only sources of inefficiency. So mu not equal to one makes me inefficient and eta not equal to one makes me inefficient. They combine together uh, to give me eta mu uh, robust efficiency. Awesome. Um, so individual efficiency. Uh, how precisely can biz be tailored to costs? And so I want to start out with the deterministic case, and I've already sort of hopefully given you the, uh, you know, the spoiler on this one. So if a bidder is facing a deterministic bid B hat, uh, then the best response problem of theirs is uh, perfectly efficient. So it is equal to one. Okay, and so here's the idea. Um, so this bidder, I imagine they have a higher value than this B hat, uh, and their best response is going to be basically to bid, you know, just tiny amount above B hat. Uh, and then, uh, this equation, the utility is the blue, uh, the B capital B hat is the, is the orange and orange plus blue is exactly equal to their value here. Okay, so there's no sort of loss in the best response that they're 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 solving. Okay, and you might not be happy with this because pure Nash don't often exist in things like first price auctions, but the same result holds when you allow approximate best response and then you get eta is approximately one. Okay, what about in the randomized case? In the randomized case, uh, eta is one minus one over E, which is a 0 0.63. So a little bit more than a half. Um, I'm actually gonna prove a weaker result here because the geometry is much more clear. I mean, you can do a proof by picture. I'm gonna prove eta is at least a half and, and there's some sort of more detailed analysis to get the one minus one over E result. Okay, so here is the picture that we have. Um, where the blue area is the utility and the orange area is the expected value of the critical bid that a bidder faces. So um, I'm imagining this U, this blue area is the best utility the, play, the player can get, which is the biggest rectangle this, we can fit underneath this curve because they're trying to optimize the size of this uh, blue rectangle. And so it's, they're making as big as possible. Okay. Um, and so imagine what would happen. And so basically the argument is, well, the orange area is bigger than what now I've shaded in orange. And the blue area is bigger than what now I've shaded underneath the curve. Okay, and why is that the case? Well, the blue area optimizes revenue underneath the curve. And this is a, 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 rec a rectangle underneath the curve. And this is a rectangle underneath the curve. So blue is bigger, right? And uh, of course, CDFs are monotone. And so um, this rectangle is certainly contained in the shaded orange area uh, for, the, for the orange part, right? And then now it's obvious that uh, the sum of the shaded areas is half of V, 
right? Because I can sort of slide one over and I see, look, it's exactly half of V. Cool. And so this is saying basically, you know, the, the inefficiency lost from the stochasticity of the environment can be at most one minus one over E, which is a 0.63. Okay, this is what you lose by having incomplete information. Okay, this is what you lose by a bidder strategizing and bidding below. And then in hindsight, if they'd seen their critical bid, they actually would have wanted to win because it's still below their value, but they don't. Cool. Jason, um, do you want to say anything about alternative pricing rules like uh, Vickery, second price? Um, can we defer that to the the Q and A afterwards? Certainly, I think it'd be great to talk about that. Um, and but I would rather not hit treat it now. <laughs> okay. Cool. So the next thing I want to do is get some more intuition for this competitive efficiency, which is how well competition is converted into into revenue. Okay. So I want to show that high competition means high revenue. Okay, and what I'm asking here is for all distributions over bids, the expected revenue of the mechanism for these dis this distribution over bids is at least a mu factor of the sort of optimal surplus of these expected thresholds, which is sort of a funny concept. Okay, but so we're hopefully we'll make sense of it here. Um, and so this optimal surplus of these expected thresholds is quantifying. Uh, the competition in the in the mechanism, and I want to say my revenue is a large fraction of this quantified competition. So the first thing that I want to observe is, so first off, this is not an equilibrium property, right? This is any distribution of bids. Okay, I'm not saying these arise in equilibrium. I'm just saying it's a distribution of bids. Okay, um, and so the first thing I want to say is that if you have something holding an expectation, right? Well, the worst case situation has to be deterministic. Okay, so equivalently for all profiles of bids, the revenue on these profiles of bids is at least mu times the optimal surplus of the critical bids that the bidder space. Okay, so if I care about this first quantity, I actually don't have to ever analyze it. I can only ever analyze the deterministic case. That's, that's actually a big, a super help. Okay, so I wanna just show you quickly the argument that the first price auction is mu equals one competitively efficient. Okay, so um, for any uh, uh, vector of bids, look, there's some critical bids. And so what is opt of the critical bids? Well, if I have a critical bids and I have a single item, then the optimal surplus of critical bids is to give the item to the agent with the highest critical bid and that maximizes the surplus of critical bids. So it's just a maximum over critical bids. Okay, but what are critical bids in a first price auction? Each bidder's critical bid is the highest of the other bids. So it's max over I, max over J not equal to I of BI. Oh, but that's just the maximum bid. Oh, but the maximum bid is just the revenue of the auction. Okay, so here we see the surplus of the sort of optimal surplus of critical bids is exactly equal to the revenue of the auction, mu equals one. Okay, now you've seen a full proof that pure Nash equilibria and first price auctions are uh, fully efficient and approximate uh, pure Nash equilibria in uh, first price auctions are approximately efficient. Um, and you've also seen Bayes Nash equilibria, the full proof that they're at least half of efficient that I didn't show you the one minus one over E, but we've seen a full proof that uh, Bayes correlated equilibria and first price auctions are at least half of the alpha welfare. Um, so some Observations about this. Um, this is not an equilibrium property. I'm not analyzing equilibria here. I'm only analyzing, you know, what happens on bids and the critical bids and revenue, right? So it's a much, actually, much more tractable analysis than analyzing equilibria would be. Okay. There are some environments where this analysis is going to be tight. Um, and this as you already saw, sort of, I get the same answer if I randomize or don't randomize. So it's actually closed under 
of randomizations you can do. And here I randomized over bids, but actually you can also randomize over environments. It's also closed in stochastic, you know, randomizations over environments too. So it applies to things like position options, which you may have heard of. Uh, it's also closed under simultaneous competition. If I have a bunch of mechanisms that are all mu individually efficient and I run them at the same time, then the composite mechanism is gonna be mu individually uh, uh, competitive efficient, uh, competitively efficient. So lots of really nice properties that follow very straightforwardly from the simple simplicity of this definition. Cool, so I have a slide, which I'm gonna skip. This slide basically shows that in combinatorial auctions, uh, this competitive efficiency is bad. And basically it takes the example we saw earlier and just says that the, I'm um, oh, sorry, this should be um, mu is one over M, not mu equal to M. Basically the ratio of revenue to the surplus of critical bids is a factor of one over M. Okay, so it can be really bad. So if M is a hundred, you're like not better than one over a hundred efficient by our analysis. Cool. Um, and so let's wrap up. Um, so, we showed that these two ways of uh, these two potential inefficiencies in auctions are basically the only things that could happen to make it inefficient. Uh, so externalities that we capture with competitive efficiency, and then the stochasticity of the environment and how well people can solve their best response problem, which we capture with individual efficiency. And so the total efficiency of the mechanism is the product of these two uh, efficiencies. Okay, um, the only, if you have a new mechanism, you wanna know if it's equilibrium or good. All you have to do is analyze competitive efficiency because we've already proved that the individual efficiency is at least a factor of two for any winner pays bid style rule. So any winner pays bid mechanism you have is automatically gonna be true that this individual efficiency is already, already proved. Okay, um, cool. On the other hand, individual efficiency, it depends on things like the payment rule, the kind of uncertainty you have, uh, et cetera. We showed it's one for pure Nash. We showed it's one minus one over E for uh, Bayes Nash or Bayes correlated um, and winner pays bid mechanisms. Uh, and uh, if you have a different kind of payment rule like all pay or previously mentioned second price, uh, or uh, then you have to analyze those kinds of uh, rules se uh, separately. Okay, um, there are a number of extensions of this that we you know, map out in the paper. So if you wanna see a bunch of other uh, auction environments where uh, mu is large, close to one or equal to one, uh, look at in the paper. Um, if you wanna see other results for uh, individual efficiency like analysis of all pay auctions, uh, that's gonna be in the paper. Um, and also uh, this is for welfare, uh, the welfare objective. If you care about the revenue objective, you can see how we have robust revenue results also uh, in the in the paper. Um, with that, I'd love to uh, to wrap up. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. I just wanted, you know, I was especially interested in uh, second price and 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 Vickery uh, and uh, how you know anything you wanted to say about uh, transposing your results into that environment. Yeah. So um, so. As you know, equilibria can be bad in the second price auction, right? The dominant strategy equilibrium is gonna be good, but there are other funny equilibria where people very much overbid and then everyone else bid zero and then you get, uh, they're very inefficient, right? Uh, so equilibria can be bad. And I have a result about all equilibria, okay? So my framework is not gonna be able to say anything about second price auctions unless you're willing to make some assumptions. Mm -hmm. So you can make assumptions like no overbidding. Like if you assume that everyone bids below their value, then you may be able to plug those second price rules into our framework. I haven't thought about that carefully enough. I do know that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we were very much inspired by a paper by Vasilis uh, Serganis and Evatardish, and they have results for the second price auction uh, in their framework, which ours is inspired by. Uh, which assume no overbidding. So I'm optimistic that if you wanted to treat things in that environment, you can. Um, one of the ways, since, since thanks for asking, and one of the ways that you can generalize this uh, winner pays bid analysis to all possible other environments 
is using revenue equivalents because you just use revenue equivalents to map things into the winner pays bid way of saying where your X axis is basically your expected, uh, uh, basically your payment divided by probably winning uh, in equilibrium and your Y axis, you're probably winning. And then you get the same curves that we get for first price auctions. And you can plug in the same analysis here. So there's like a transformation into first price space, just like there's a transformation into uh, bid your value space that you can do. Uh, and so you can always apply that transformation and just get results directly out of our, our framework. Uh, but some things are not true when you do this transformation, like um, uh, this transformation is, uh, of course, not linear. And so you're not going to get things like uh, uh, closure under randomization when you do this uh, transformation. So it does make sense to do the analysis separately for like a second price style auction. Excellent. That's very helpful. Are there more questions? Yeah, can you say more about what the players know? So do they know the environment? I think they do, right? Yeah, absolutely. We are um, solving for equilibrium. And so um, as um, basically this, this is the key picture. Uh, this is the key picture, right? So bidders are looking at their best response problem. They face some interim rule. They know their value. They're looking in expectation about whatever else is happening for whatever situation they're in. Okay, and so so actually, you know, any any knowledge model here you want is fine. And this result basically needs to hold in the interim stage for the agent. Okay, so and actually, we show it always does. <laughs> so why doesn't the designer elicit the environment in the first stage and then run this, the optimal mechanism? Yeah, look, uh, that that kind of a mechanism. Uh, you so this is an approach from implementation theory, uh, which um, which if you want the optimal mechanism, yeah, this this is uh, a way to get an always optimal in every environment mechanism. Now we don't tend to see those mechanisms in practice, and so I'm a little bit nervous about this approach. And so there are probably some assumptions that aren't being modeled that are. Uh, really critical assumptions. Uh, and this approach actually is, is able to get robust analysis of auctions we do see in practice. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, that's it's, basically all I have to say about that. It, it's, it's robust if you assume that people play an equilibrium, right? But um, not robust if they don't. Yeah. And so I'm very nervous, actually. So uh, one of the reasons why... Um, yeah, so I like actually this. So here you saw, um, actually, here you saw, I sort of restricted the family of mechanisms to ones where we solicit bids. And these bids are basically, you know, willingness to pays, right? So I'm not really allowing you in this framework to ask for beliefs or beliefs on beliefs or like <laughs> all these complicated things, which seems sort of unnatural to ask. Right. Um, and I'm only asking here which uh, allocation algorithms are, are are good. And so you can ask basically what are optimal winner pays bid mechanisms in my framework. And you've already excluded uh, these implementation theory kind of results. And so I think you that's sort of an interesting family of mechanisms to look at uh, to, to get uh, uh, robust results. Um, I, there is a line of work looking at these robust questions from a design point of view of when I'm trying to design a good auction. Um, and I do think a main challenge for that entire literature is coming up with sensible ways of excluding preposterous mechanisms, like where we ask people to report all of their complicated beliefs. And those beliefs are actually correct in some way and, and aren't just like horribly overfit or just incorrect or, and you know, there's no way to account for the fact that people really don't know. Right, like so bidding in an eBay auction, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, so eBay maybe should have published the auction. Everyone report their beliefs on everything and then the seller will run the optimal thing. And I'm like, come on, no, right? Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, and so I view that approach as basically like sort of, it's almost like a lower bound for the model. Like we wanna say that, you know, a good model for equilibria is people bid in equilibria, like Bayes-Nash equilibrium, that's a good model. But, you know, kramer McLean and this implementation theory stuff shows that somehow the models are too strong, right? And we're getting preposterous results and maybe we need to figure out how to handle that. And I think implementation theory and kramer McLean are our two sort of failing examples of the models too strong. Uh, and my way of getting around that is sort of a, a, a duct tape. It's sort of like, let's just restrict to these winner pays bid mechanisms. And now we don't, don't have a model being too strong. I think this is a really good point. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk, Jason. Um, I want to ask, um, so like you prove auctions are at least this good, this, uh, mu times new main theorem bound, um, this, this inequality isn't tight, right? Some auctions might be even better than this. Uh, that's uh, a great point. Uh, the, I've, in, in one of my first slides, I pointed out that for the general environments I've considered it actually, these results are tight. Um, and so oh, cool. for each individual and problem for for um, uh, competitive efficiency and for individual efficiency, those analyses are tight in their respective examples typically. Yes. Um, but the combination might not be tight if you start restricting things. Now in Bayes correlated for like a first price auction, they are tight. It's one minus one over E is the best, is the sort of worst equilibrium of the Bayes correlated auction. But if you look for, uh, if you look at uh, Bayes-Nash and you assume for instance, values are independent but not identical, then it's actually one minus one over E squared is the tight analysis in a very recent paper, uh, oh. excellent recent paper, uh, showed that actually the, the bound we get of one minus one over E is not tight in that restriction of the environment. So Bayes-Nash equilibrium and product distributions, you get a better analysis. Cool, so it depends on the family of environments you're looking at sometimes it is tight yeah sometimes you have a gap and so and so you can make these results tight by allowing a more general family essentially uh yeah making it harder but for and that holds for any mechanism m you're starting with any winner pays bid or uh, that's a good question i don't actually know the answer to that can you make it tight for any mechanism I don't know. Um, one of the one of the ways of making the competitive efficiency analysis tight is you have to if you, you can assume that you know it's like bidders and items like an incompatible auction, and you can introduce new bidders who want the same items as some other bidder. Oh, that's sort of a general trick for making it tight. And so, in some auction environments, it doesn't make sense to think about what it means to add another bidder. Uh, but if you can think of adding another bidder that looks just like another bidder, then usually the the competitive efficiency bound is tight. That's one of the individual bounds, uh, not yeah. the joint. And then the individual efficiency bound is also tight. And then you just need to look at environments where you don't lose anything mm -hmm. combining the two. Right, right, right. Somehow, like, um, the this tagline of these are the only two reasons for inefficiency, only two sources of inefficiency are, it, it's really compelling. But I'm wondering, like, uh, what are other ways to uh, formalize it other than, like, this product? Uh, bound holds. Yeah, so yeah. you're you're very valid. Like you might be able to break down sources of inefficiency in some other way that also combines and gets tight analyses, maybe yeah. with different worst cases. Uh, you're mm -hmm. just very. Uh, <laughs> it could be right. Um, I one thing I do like about this is also decomposing the parts of the analysis. Like we mm -hmm. basically this decomposition, you have the mechanism for any input, right? And looking at revenue yeah. and the, these critical bids, which is only a function of the mechanism. It has nothing to do with values of the agents or beliefs or any of this stuff that's like a pain right. to analyze. And that's the new thing you have to analyze whenever you have a new mechanism. So the new mm -hmm. thing you have to analyze has nothing to do with equilibrium, nothing to do with beliefs, nothing to do with these complicated things that we do in game theory, right? The thing that has to do with beliefs and values is individual efficiency. And for winner pays bid mechanisms, we did it. It's one mm -hmm. minus one over E. Right. 
you never have to do it again. Right. Oh, that is very interesting. Thanks.